Yes, we are facing enclosures in the uh, northern countries. But sometimes I think the division between southern countries and northern countries can be misleading for us. Like in the United States, uh, so many uh, new and fresh voices have come from the south into North America. And so especially from the Hispanic part of the Americas and bring an experience of uh, struggle, an experience even of the commons, which the people in the north can learn from. So now this, because of immigration, this difference between the north and the south, at least from a working class perspective, is, is not quite as severe as it has been in the past. From a uh, perspective of the ruling class, you know, they wish to maintain this division. They wish to maintain the borders. Mm -hmm. So the big enclosure of North America is to build a fence, is to build a wall against South America, against the Hispanic-speaking people. And this, this wall is just is totally inefficient, you know, as uh, keeping people out, because a big part of the movement always is to find the openings just like the Puerto de Sol is a, is a gate, you know, through a wall. So, uh, but that wall is a symbol, I think, of other forms of enclosure also in the United States. And the biggest enclosure that I want to bring to you is that the USA is number one in prison population in the world. We, there are more prisoners, more prisons are built now than is money for schools. Uh, the budget for prisons and incarceration, which means putting behind walls, is now much greater than for education. So for immigration, for social discipline, um, and I think also we have to look at the mortgage crisis as a type of enclosure, you know, throwing people out of their homes. You know, this is also an enclosure. And this is a very serious enclosure of, of a basic human right, which is shelter. Yeah, does it start with patriarchy? Does it start with a commodity? If it starts with patriarchy, we put it back 10,000 years, 5,000 years? If it starts with a commodity, we put it back maybe somewhat less, maybe 5,000 years, the origin of money, maybe 5,000 years. If, speaking of in Spain from North America, we all praise 1492, so 500 years ago is the beginning of capitalism with the discovery of America and the search for gold, the going to Africa, the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the development of the capitalist class as owning the state, as forming their own money, their own banks. I think we go back 500 years. So we have 500 years of, uh, of struggle over the state and the class divisions between the bourgeoisie and the different working people. That begins, as I say, and it's all right from the beginning, it's international. It's transatlantic slavery. It's workers from Europe having to join with indigenous people in America, in the maroon colonies. So right from the start, the capitalist project is then to divide those people, divide by religion, divide by race, divide by ethnicity. You know, and this is on top of the divisions of patriarchy, of unpaid labor. This story is well told by a book by Silvia Federici, which is published by oh, <laughs> Traficantes de Sueños, which is the trafficking of dreams. Because all along there have been dreams, as well as dreams of equality, dreams of life without the state, dreams of an autonomous a condition with our fellow humans. And you can find uh, that has a history. And it's the job of 
is one of the tasks of historians, professional historians, to, to discover that history. That it's possible to live creatively without the state. Yeah, I think so. And I think, because usually people think that history is the history of the state. Because history began as part of the, the self-congratulation of the state. Mm -hmm. So it's expansion, that's one phase. Uh -huh. You know, to the other parts uh -huh. of the world, that's imperialism. Another phase is intensification of using the tools against us. Uh -huh. So the modes of production, the development of the factory, of the plantation, and then the change in our bodies is also has a history, and that's a history of capitalism. This is part of us, that the men are trained to be killers. The women are trained to be breeders. The only job in life for women is to produce more proletarians. The only job for a proletarian is to kill other proletarians. Those are the foundational like gender mo models for man and woman. And we still live with it. It's not, uh, we can't congratulate ourselves and say, oh, that's all over. No, we still live with it. And it's a basis of in neoliberalism and it's a, a basis of the capitalist development i think i think the the main one is a result in the 20th century of what we call the welfare state or the guarantee of education, health, and housing. In North America, we called it the Four Freedoms, you know, in the great uh, World War II. Freedom from fear, freedom from want, then freedom of speech and freedom of religion. But freedom of want was the notion that the, how, the shelter, the health, and the social security of humans and their welfare in old age or in childhood was a communal responsibility. And that could not be met by those vulnerable parts of the population, by the, the laws of market rationality, where it's dog eat dog of competition. So this notion of, uh, of welfare for all was really a product of the traditional industrial working class. I mean, of their, that was a great victory of that era, of a century, you know, of struggle. And I think uh, that's, that common good is, is being destroyed by austerity and neoliberalism. Well, the, yes, it is. I mean, the answer is yes. Uh, but I think that, that yes, uh, I personally have to be, feel cautious about it, in that uh, it requires all the dignity of our movement. I mean, in the American civil rights movement, in the American anti-war movement, against the war in Vietnam, you know, long ago. It required the participation of many different sectors of the population. And to, to quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the higher law is not, is only evoked in human action. You know, when large groups of people not in desperation, but in complete responsibility for human welfare, take to the streets and take to the occupation of the land for the redress of grievances. And if those grievances are not redressed, then we must do it ourselves. 
and this is the beginning of this is the beginning of resistance so it's i think that's the the, the tone of this rite of resistance i think is very important because it's uh, it's going to produce opposition and it can produce danger so the dangers must be very great you know but it's deeply important that we begin thinking about it and thinking about resistance must always include what do we want? You know, how will we cooperate among ourselves? How will we manage our heterogeneity? How will we manage our equality? And if we are confident of that, then I think the resistance, the opposition to resistance will just crumble.